And now, another timely and powerful message from Pastor Emmanuel Williams and Imitators of God Ministries, Colossal Vivacious Church in Tallahassee. What I want to do today is just introduce this particular account. I know it's going to take me a few more Sundays to address the the parallels or the, impl- the implications of this scripture. Um, so what I want to do first is look at the text within context, and then I look at the numerous and varied applications, parallels they are to our lives. Is that all right? So let's look at the text in context. And since I believe this particular, this particular text, um, the Holy Ghost would have us as a church it's not by coincidence we're going through this text. I think it is going to help us as a church and it's going to help us individually. Amen? So what I want to do is go through, let's read um, 2 Corinthians chapter 21, verse 1. The Bible says here, there was a famine in the days of David. How long was the famine? Three years, year after year, there was a famine. How many of you, you feel that way sometimes? It's just one thing after the other. A farming is one year past. My needs are not met. Lord, I've been talking to you about some things. Year two, Lord, what's going on? Year three. And so when David saw that was unusual, say that's unusual. The Bible said he began to inquire of the Lord. Do you mean if you agree that's a good thing? To ask the Lord a few questions. Because he has, the Bible said, the Lord's ear is not heavy. That he cannot hear. Amen. And his hands are not short. That he cannot help. God is well able to help. And he is able to hear. Amen. Amen. So since David knows that, David said something is wrong. Three years, no rain. And if we need a bumper crop, we need rain. Uh, So David said, let me ask the Lord what's happening. And the Bible says, the Lord answered David. The Lord said, this is why there is a famine. It is for Saul. Now Saul was dead, but he's going to tell us what Saul did. For his bloody house, because he stood a Gibeonite. Saul was on a genocide mission. Uh huh. He wanted to wipe out the Gibeonites from the nation of Israel, and so if in if you look at in Exodus, in Exodus, we don't have the time now. Joshua had made a covenant with the Gibeonites so they can dwell amongst Israel. How many of you know God is interested in everybody? How many of you know that the Israelites are not only the people of God? I know some of you can't even say Amen. Let me say that again. The Bible says, "For God." Why am I shouting? For God so loved the world. Now don't get that wrong now. God had to start somewhere. God had to start where? Somewhere. But he didn't have the Israelites only on mind. I know some of you are saying, listen to me. I know Israel, God used Israel, and the nation of Israel to give the world the Bible. I know the, I know the Bible says, God's, this nation is the apple of God's eye. Are you with me? But I also saw Jesus call them children of the devil. Are you getting what I'm saying? Can we speak the truth? The truth is liberating. Amen. We know God had to start somewhere. So he used them to bring the scripture to the world. But you and I are the apple of God's eye. Oh, come on somebody. Don't count yourself out. Now I'll support Israel every day over every other nation. But hear me. They are not ahead of me. You have no, I am a son of God. You are a child of God. Israel is not above you. So God said, you all, Saul, because of his zeal for his people, began to eviscerate, if I can use that word. This particular account is a beautiful account because it shows how God sees a covenant when you give somebody a word. (laughs) Especially when you're going to covenant. Oh, you better show up. Or if you can't show up, say something. Don't just ignore what was previously 
previously agreed upon. Amen. Don't forget your covenants. Don't forget the agreement. Don't forget what came out of your mouth. Well, anyhow. I was talking to someone, Wood, and the person said to me, Pastor, I want to be, uh, you know, can we be in covenant? I said, about what? And I said, well, this is my terms for covenant. I said, when we come together and form a bond, this is my this is my commitment to the bond. I said, if I die, I am raising from the dead. I'm coming to meet my part of the bond. Then I'll go continue with my dying. Will you do that? I have gotten an answer. You see? Are you getting what I'm saying? That is my commitment. You can't. You're, you're just looking for a friend. I understand that. But brother, there is a friend that sticks closer. The Bible said, can you go to verse 2? God gave him his answer. And uh, um, David said, oh, we found a problem. The problem is Saul's wickedness. You see how, that's why since you have to be so careful. When you leave, your acts live way beyond you. When you die, sorry, when you die, whatever you do on the earth, it leaves further than your existence so that's why we have to choose properly we have to make the right choices let me continue and so the, and so uh, and the king called the gibeonites so david called them they were living among the israelites amen they told they told joshua this is what they said to joshua joshua we will be your slaves we'll help you carry the wood and do whatever you have to do we'll help you carry your your armors and just let us leave and Joshua said, okay, and they got into a covenant. Saul knew that. He still ignored that covenant. And the Gibeonites, as they, the Bible says, they were among the children of Israel, but the remnant of the Amorites and the children of Israel had sworn unto them. I went ahead of, my time, ahead of myself right here. And Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. You know, hear me. Saul believed in ethnic cleansing. Jesus believed in everybody loving one another. Some of you can't even say amen. Let me say that again. Amen. Saul believed in ethnic cleansing. Jesus believed in everybody. For God so loved the world. That he gave his... Are you with me? Not for God so loved Israel. You know, sometimes, you, you know, it is people's expectation uh, uh, in Christendom not to talk the truth. The truth you want to hear is support Israel. And I, I'm, I'm doing it too. But I'm saying when the Bible gives an account, we have to go with it. Well, <laughs> all right then. Okay, praise the Lord. All right, can you go to verse 3? Verse 3 says here, can you go to verse 3 quickly? Wherefore David said unto the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? And wherewith shall I make the atonement? What can I do to atone for the wrongs of Saul? Mm-hmm. That you may bless the inheritance of the Lord. David said, our blessings are on hold. Our lives have been hindered. Because of what a previous ruler. Can I say the previous ruler? A previous dictator. Can I say that? Uh -huh, a previous monarch did. Verse 4 quickly. Verse 4. It says here. And the Gibeonites said unto him. We will have no silver, nor gold of Saul, nor of his house. Neither for us shall thou kill any man in Israel. You hear what he's saying? He said, we don't want silver. We don't want gold. Don't kill any Israelites. What we want, we want the blood for blood. Now, human, you know, we humans are something else. We love revenge. So the Bible says, and he said, what shall I say? What will I do for you? Can you go to verse 5? Verse 5 says, uh-huh, I'm getting to my point. And this answered the king, the man that consumed us, Saul who destroyed us, and that devised against us that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the coast of Israel. This is what we want to do. Verse 6. Verse 6 says, let us, let several men of his sons, 
be delivered unto us. And we will hang them up unto the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord did choose. You know God chose Saul. Okay. And the king said, I will what? <laughs> they shall give us seven sons of Saul, whether they be immediate sons or grandsons. Give them to us so we can hang them. We want blood for blood. You know, the Bible, listen to me, the Bible is, is just explaining what happens in that culture. Let me say that again. God is not condoning that. God is just reporting. Amen? How many of you thank God for, thank God that we live, we live now in, in a democracy? Well, <laughs> Some of you don't sound like you're happy. Some of you sound like you want to leave during when one man rule. When one man rule, all he had to do is turn his finger this way and you're dead. Oh, we thank God for democracy. Hallelujah. Oh, we bless you, Jesus. Since we have to talk the truth. You know, sometimes it's very uneasy talking the truth. Hello, brother. Hello. You know, sometimes it's uneasy talking the truth. <laughs> but because I've surrendered to Jesus, it's not, it's not hard. Amen. Praise the Lord. The truth is like a sword. It cuts both ways. Oh, yes. So, so here, here now, here. They said, we need these men. And David said, I'll give them. Verse 7 quickly. David said, that's what you want? Because we want the farming to stop. But the king spared Mephibosheth. I'll explain that later. The son of Jonathan, the son of Saul. You know when Jonathan and Saul died? Amen. Son, uh, uh, that was um, Saul's son, firstborn. He, he had a covenant with David. He said, David, I want you to take over my family. Protect my family. Defend my family. Amen. So, God, so that was Saul's son. So David said, I'm not giving them Jonathan. I'm in covenant with him, even if he's not alive. Amen. So, so he said, um, uh, be, so there was an oath between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. Verse 8, quickly. Verse 8 says here, but the king took the two sons of Rispa. She's the one I want to talk about today. It's pronounced Rispa. It's spelled Rispa, but it's pronounced Rizpa. Mm -hmm. Rizpa. The daughter of Aya. Whom she bear unto Saul. She bear harmony and Mephibosheth, that's a different Mephibosheth. Saul had two Mephibosheth in his family. One, a son, the other, grandson. Mm -hmm. That's his grandson. Uh -huh. And the five sons of Michal. You know, Michal was David's first wife. Saul gave David Michal. Amen. And when Saul and David fell, amen, Saul took Michal and gave him to another man. And she bore that man a lot of children. Do you want to find strange? Saul gave Michal to another man. Do you know when David became king, he still went for his wife? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He had so many wives and concubines. Just leave the man with the one woman. <laughs> Amen? You have to go back. You got 12, 13. And the Bible said, listen to me, the Bible said that the man loved his wife so much, he, he cried all the way. <laughs> he followed behind, I want my wife. Anyhow. David said, no, she was my wife first. You almost read the Old Testament sometimes, you'll just laugh. How many of you, you like a good belly laugh? That's what will happen as you read God's word. <laughs> anyhow. anyhow, so the Bible said... David gave. <laughs> Anyhow, let me move on. Amen. Her husband's name was Adriel, the son of Bazila, the, uh, the Meholathite. Can you go to verse 9 quickly? Uh huh. 9. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hung them in the hill before the Lord, and they fell all seven together. All seven men were hanged. 
and they fell all seven together and were put to death in the days of the harvest. Important, in the days of the harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of the barley harvest. I'll explain that because there is a reason why God is giving us these times, these seasons. Are you with me? There is a message. As I said, I'm looking at the text in context. Then we look at the implication, the parallels that can be drawn from the text. The Holy Ghost saw it fit to put this account amongst numerous in the Bible for us. Amen. The truth be told, this account has radically changed my life. When the principles, amen, are submitted to and lived out. Can you go to verse 10? Verse 10 reads, verse 10 reads, uh-huh. And who's that? Rich spa, the daughter of Aya, took sackcloth and spread it for her upon the rock. From the beginning of, here it comes again. From the beginning of harvest until water dropped upon them out of heaven. And suffered neither the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beast of the field by night. Can you go to verse 11? And it was told David what Rispa, the daughter of Aya, the concubine of Saul, had done. See what's happening here? Two of her sons are hung. Mm -hmm. And she said to herself, All I need is for my sons to get a proper burial. That's all I'm asking for. Yes, they're hanged. Uh-huh. But they don't have to be eaten by birds. They don't have to be eaten by vultures and buzzards. Amen? Okay. Or by beasts in the night. That's what happened. So she said, I'm going to come beneath their cross. Right where they were hung. She said, not only that, I'm going to come on a rock. The Bible said she did it from the barley time until harvest. Since she didn't stay there one night. Uh-huh. She stayed there for a long time. We look at the time. She stayed there. Listen. And the Bible says what she did, finally, David heard about it. Can you say the king heard about it? Oh, hear, hear, hear this. She stayed there long enough for the king to hear about it. So her wishes for her children could be honored. I'm about to make a point here. <laughs> oh, glory be to Are you hearing me? Now, now listen, listen, listen. Hear, hear me now. She stayed there how long? Long enough for the king to hear about it. So that the wishes for her sons. Let me, let me tell something to you. Sorry about that. Let me, let me tell something with you. Do you know that our kids, our children, our children who are spirit filled full of the Holy Ghost when they leave the church and they go and they go to universities well and, and they, what, they go to universities and they get influenced by a secular professor sometimes they come home and their faith has been torpedoed Look, they leave spirit filled. They come back spiritually dead. And listen, bro. Mothers, you can do something about it. Uh, uh, you, you, there is a silent cry out there. This is a silent cry. Our kids are going out to college. And they're coming back unsaved. What's happening? Our kids are going to the workplace. And they're coming back unsaved. What's the problem? Listen to me. Look at what Rizpa did. And you'll get your answer. You know, this is what I want to say. My wife told me about a month or two ago, she had a dream. And the dream was she was casting out the demon out of a, of a child. And um, I've been, I was walking, asking God, what is that about? Casting out a demon from a child. And while I was walking, the Lord said to me, our children are under attack by the devil. Our what? Our children are under attack. But you know, you know, while we fight with one another, hello, some of you, <laughs> while we are still looking, amen, to be satisfied, while we are still looking, amen, amen, are you hearing what I'm saying? Still looking to, to, uh, to be right, can I say that? Uh, still looking to be right, not realizing we have a younger generation to fight for. 
I know the, the amen will be a little scarce, but that's okay. Just, just stay with me. Praise the Lord. You, you understand what I'm saying? While we are still looking to be right, they are looking. They are looking. Mm -hmm. And the devil is saying, you fight on. Mm -hmm. You try to be right because that child here, there I want. That young generation, they are the ones I'm coming behind. They are the ones I'm after. Are you getting me? And so that's what's happening, brothers and sisters. And so what, the dream, God said to me, this is what's happening. And hear me, hear me. It doesn't have to be a child. It could be something you birth. Uh, <laughs> it could be something God has placed on your heart. Amen. To bring forth. But whatever it is, I have a couple of steps to give us. Amen. Because I'm going to share with you how people have heard this story and they've used it to radically change their lives. So the Bible says, um, here, uh, the, the king heard, and notice what the king did. The king didn't just say and do nothing. When David heard that the lady has been camping beneath her son's dead body. Now hear me. I, I will tell you quickly. The barley, the beginning of, the, the beginning of harvest, sorry, the, the barley time is the time they planted. That was between uh, March, April. The harvesting time was around November. That's about six months. Six months the lady camped beneath the dead body of her sons. By the time the king heard, the boy's body was rotted. Can you imagine the stench? The smell? But she stayed right there. <laughs> she wanted God to honor her wishes for her children. Let me tell you what Rich, let me tell you what Rich Spa knew, we do not know. She knew, even though the umbilical cord, the umbilical cord is severed during birth, the influence is still there. <laughs> Psalms, 120, Psalms 127 says, children are like arrows in the hands of their parents. Rich Spa said, these are my arrows. Yes, they are dead, but there is one more wish. I have for them and I will not be denied. <laughs> uh, uh, there is a silent cry, Elder. Why are our children going off to college and you're coming back unsaved? Twice the child of the devil. What's going on? Hmm? What's happening? What is it? What's going on? Why aren't we vigilant in ensuring that our kids are taken care of? And hear me, hear me, brothers and sisters. Can I be honest with you? I don't know if you noticed, but right now, you know who, do you know who came out of the closet? Witches. Witches. They are now on Facebook calling themselves Christian witches. That's an oxymoron. You know that. Hello, somebody. They call themselves, because you know why, the, the, you know why they're coming out now, Doc? We Christians, we are in. We're in the house. We're going nowhere. Hello? Hello? Well, do you know churches, not, you know churches, you get spiritually lifted, but sometimes you have to get corrected. Amen. Christians are now staying home. The witches are out. Well, <laughs> advertising, we are now Christian witches. Yeah, the devil is a liar. Hear me, saints, I'm hoping, this is my hope, this is my wish, that after we, f we are done with that, se that series right here, many of us, not only mothers, but mothers and fathers will take our place. Amen, we'll take our place on the rock. Where did she take her place? On the rock. <laughs> what the Bible said, she spread some sackcloth. Can you say fasting? Yes, sir. She spread some sackcloth and ashes over her head to show she's humbling herself. Uh-huh. She to show that that is how you fight. Listen to me. Fighting in Christendom is not easy. <laughs> fighting is uncomfortable. You got to deny yourself of some things. You got to deny yourself of comfort. Mm. And you got to make your way somewhere on the rock. Yes, yes, yes. And then you start fighting. For your kids. For our kids. 
Amen? I'm hoping, since, let's finish here, let's read verse 12. Verse 12 says, listen to what verse 12 says. Verse 12 says, and David went, when the king heard, what did the king do? He went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son from the men of Jabesh Gilead. Now listen, Saul had died and the body of Saul and Jonathan was desecrated. Saul did not go for it. Uh, David did not go for it because this man really tried to kill David. And so David left his bones. But after, listen to me, hear, hear how powerful this is. After what Rispa did, after what she did, when David heard that, listen to me, everybody else benefited. <laughs> it wasn't only her son. The previous king, his body was taken down. And by that time, you know what they found when they went to uh, uh, retrieve uh, uh, Saul's and Jonathan's body? Did you know what they find? Only the skeleton. Just bones. Buzzards at them. Wild animals at them. And David came and he took down the bones of Jonathan. He took down the bones of Saul. And then he went and he took down the bones of Ritzpah's two sons. Not only Reese past two son, Michael's. What? Where was Michael? Her five sons were desecrated also. Where, where was she? She didn't show up. He, hear me, hear me. Can I say something? Some mothers just don't show up. Hello? Hello? Some mothers just don't show up to fight for their kids. Can I push it further? Some fathers just don't show up to fight for their kids. Can, can I bring it closer? Some of us fathers, amen, will not show up and fight for our kids. Will not say, Father, for the next 30 seconds I'm going to speak in tongues, build myself on my holy faith, but that 30 seconds is for my son or for this child or that child. If you don't have a son, adopt one. Because the kids need their parents to fight for them. The devil is after our generation. Our younger generation, he's trying. But it's time for us to take place on the rock. Just recently, my wife and I, somebody we know so well, somebody we loved, so know so well, we just happened to be talking to him, just a pastor. And so we heard some things. I'm about to go to college, we heard some things. And... So I ask, is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? And he said, mm. now this is a child we knew from church. You know, parents usually say, well, I don't know what's going on. We raised them up in church. You did not. You brought them to church. <laughs> you brought them to church. Amen. Hello. You brought them, but, but, but did you do what the Bible says we must do in Deuteronomy? The Bible says as a parent, you're supposed to take, teach them the word of God. Write the word of God on the doors of your house. On, are you getting me? You as a parent has a part to play. You're supposed to come, take the Bible and read with them. Hello? And ask them, what's going on? What do you think by that? It's amazing when Emmanuel and I sit to read and I ask him, what does the Bible say here? You know they know. Do you know they know? They behave like they don't. They're just waiting for you to enforce it. Waiting for you to support what they believe in. They're not waiting for no preacher to, to do that. They're waiting for you as a parent to say, yes, son. That's correct. Well. <laughs> and so, the silent cry. Why our kids? Why are, the, why are their faith being torpedoed? The first semester. After being in church, you said in church for 17 years, one semester, something's wrong. Something is wrong. And so I'm going to start a set of, a set of sermon series. Listen to, listen, to, listen to the topic of the series. It's mothers, you're up. It's your time to step to the plate and start fighting for your kids. Do you know the amount of pain a mother feels when her young child, whether it's, whether it's a son or a daughter, grow up and then 
fall away from the faith. Do you know what it does to a parent? The condemnation, the heartbreak, the disappointment. I know I have parents talk to me about it. Pastor, can you pray for my daughter? Pray for my son. What's going on? Such and such and such and such. Amen. Praise the Lord. When I'm with you, I'm praying because this is what I know. I know you got a powerful tool that's praying. Amen. And you still have that influence. Hear me, hear me. It doesn't matter where they are. You can break them or make them with your mouth. It, let me tell you, whether or not they are married. Well, some of you. Some of you. Yeah. And some of you don't believe that. Amen. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you who did a rich spa did. Rich Spa did. Rich Spa said, this is, these are my sons. Look, I didn't have the power to protect them while they were alive, but I can do something now. I still have that power, that influence, that attachment is still there. And I'm going to stay until the king hears about it. I'm not powerless. I got the word. I got the Holy Ghost. Well, you know, these are the sermons. Sometimes we don't get a lot of amens. Because, you know, sometimes, listen, listen, hear me. I'm not blaming you for anything. I'm just telling you what the devil is doing. Yeah. Amen. That's what he's after. I'm just telling you what he's doing. He's after our kids. There will be nobody to run the church if all the kids go to college and first semester their faith torpedoed. That's what the devil wants. Amen. He wants that to happen. So then we can say, what happened to the church? What happened to the church? What happened to the, well, well, we did not hear me. The Bible says that God was so disappointed with the Israelites because he counted on them to teach their children the word. And they failed. So a generation who did not know God rose up. <laughs> they never sat with their kids and spoke to them. They were too busy talking about God. God didn't give us garlics. God didn't give us lick, uh, uh, cucumbers. How come there is no salt in the desert? Huh? Talking, well, I know. They say, I know God opened the Red Sea. I know God, but, God, but can God spread a table in the wilderness? Think about you just saw the Red Sea parted. You walk through and you prick the water. <laughs> That's what I would do. I would just prick it. Is that for real? <laughs> Wouldn't you rather just push your hand through it? <laughs> Man, that's some power. And you got on the other side and you're asking, yes, we saw God parted the water. But can he spread a table in the wilderness? Food, 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 food. Just talk about food. Just no constructive talk. Never taking the time to speak to your children about God. Never taking the time, let's, let's let me put it this way, to speak to our kids about God. There was a time I got so busy, God said to me, do not forget Emmanuel. I got so busy trying to make a living. God said to me, do not forget Emmanuel. Hear me. EJ knew so many scriptures when he was a baby. He knew very, he knows very little now. Because I forgot my wife and I sometimes we forgot to reinforce it. But I still make some time to meet with him. Amen. Because we know he's in college to read the word with him. Praise the Lord. I gave him on his way to school. I gave him his, uh, his, um, his affirmations, I'm hoping he says it. I'm not there. I can only trust the word. Amen. I can only trust God and the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. But are you getting my point, saints? And so the Bible says, listen, and David went and took them. Uh, let, let's go to verse two, uh, 13 quickly before I bring it to a close. And he brought up from thence the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his sons. And they gathered the bones of them that were what? Hanged. Can you go to verse 14? Verse 14 reads, uh huh. And the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his sons, buried there in the country of Benjamin in Zilah, in the sculpture of Kish's father. Hello? Yes. Not the sepulchre, not sculpture. Sepulchre. So they buried everybody in Saul's tomb. And he, listen to the last sentence. And after that, God was what? entreated for the land after that they went to God they said God we did what you told us to do the rain came and they got a bumper crop 
Saints, I want to ask you this morning though, what is holding up your bumper crop? I'm just, I, I'm, I'm just a little preacher from Tallahassee. I believe sent by God, amen, to share with you some information. Open up, help open up your eyes to what the devil is trying to do. Amen? Because we cannot repeat the same issues, the same problems the Israelites find themselves in. Amen? So let, let, let me share this with you. This particular text, this account, as I said, I wanted to go through it in context, and now I want to look at the implications. What the parallels, what is God telling us here? Many people, many commentators seem to think that it talks about justice and atonement. Some said it speaks about faithfulness to covenants. Others said it speaks about compassion and respect. But this is the one I like. Many people think it's talking about intense intercessory praying. Intense intercessory praying. Hear me. Now is the time. Now is the time for intense intercessory praying. Well, I... I I don't want to ask for a show of hands, but how many of you, sometimes it just feels so dry, just, well, just, just dry, just not interested. Hello? <laughs> well, just what? Just not interested. In other words, something else has taken the place of God in our hearts. Something has crowded out the word of God from our hearts and now we feel like an empty shell. I don't know about you, I've been there. Amen, I have been there. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? Now is the time to change it. Now is the time to what? It's a call to mothers in particular. Yeah, fathers too, but it's a call to mothers. Now is the time for you to start fighting for our children. It doesn't matter what age our children are. And if you don't have a child, adopt one. I said that too quickly. If you don't have a child, adopt one. Now is the time to forget about our own life's pursuits. Hello? Well, <laughs> what you don't want is for the rapture to take place, just like that. The rapture to take place. The Bible says, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the trump, in the twinkling of an eye, our bodies are going to be changed. Changed. Our bodies are going to change from mortal to immortal. In other words, we are going to have the glorified body. Amen. And then the Bible says, we are going to meet him in the air. Which means that we are going to be hovering are you with me? In the air and the folks on the earth will be looking up at us hovering. Well, <laughs> you, <laughs> the, the Bible says we're going to make the dead in Christ will rise first. Right. All the dead saints, they're going to get the glorified body first and they're going to be hovering in the air. And then those of us who are alive and remain say us, us. we're going to meet him in the air. And the world is going to be watching. And then Jesus is going to say, let's go. And everybody just disappear. You want your child to be there. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Let me tell you, you want your baby boy, your baby daughter to be there. Amen. There is a verse in Revelation that always strikes me. It says, God has to wipe the tears away from our eyes. Because we'll, have, we'll know whether or not they are there. We'll know whether or not they're there. And the thought of they being not there. Lord have mercy. The thought of what's going to happen to them in the hands of the Antichrist. That is why I'm appealing to those of us who are here this morning. Since, hear me. Now is the time for intense intercessory prayer. Now is the time for what? Intense intercessory prayer. The devil is not playing. You hear me? He's out. Male wizards, female witches, they're out. Are you with me? It is time that we take the authority we have. Why is this shit so cold? I mean, no amens at all. Let me see. It is time we take the authority we have. I'll tell you, I think we are tired. Amen. 
That breakfast, that breakfast full of carbohydrates just have us weighed down. And not an amen. Not an amen. Amen. <laughs> Her name, Ritzpa. She... Her name meant, hear me, her name meant hot, well pieced together. Let me give you the exact definition. I don't want to miss out because I think there is, I think the commentators, I mean, they did not do a good job in giving us a description of who she is. Amen. Her name, I'm getting there. Lord, I give you glory. I'm not missing anything since. I'm going to take my time to go through this. Amen. Praise God, because I think what God told me to share with you is important. Oh, I'm getting there. Hallelujah. I hope I didn't pull up the wrong file. Oh, so much to talk about. God is so good. It's coming. Hallelujah. Yes, right here. Her name has two interesting meanings. One, red hot coals. Red hot stones, fired up, full of zeal. That's one meaning. The other meaning is pieced together. In other words, she was well put together. And since people's names were inextricably linked to one's character, and sometimes even their parents, one commentator said, listen to what he said. He said she was a very attractive lady. Uh, meticulously pieced together or put together by God in today's world uh, colloquially she would be described as a hot mama <laughs> hear me hear me hear me for that matter hear that for that matter the Bible tells us Abner who was one of Saul's um, when Saul died Abner who was one of the officers in Saul's army went for her he's been looking at the man's wife that's how attractive she was. But she wasn't only, I think there's a play on words. Listen, 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 there's a play on words. Yes, she may have been well put together, but hear that. But since seriously speaking, I think her name has spiritual implications that has been overlooked. Listen to me. In rebuking the church in Laodicea for their indifference, apathy, and lack of interest for being spiritually dead, Jesus told John to tell the church, Revelation 3, 15. He said, I know your works. That you're neither cold nor hot. Are you with me? He said, I know your works. I know you. You are neither cold nor what? He said, I wish you were cold or? He said, Listen, and hot means spiritually alive. So I think her name means she was spiritually alive. She knew how to fight a good fight of faith. Are you with me, saints? So the Bible says, uh, right here, God told John to tell the church, look, I wish you were cold. If you were cold, you can satisfy, you can quench your thirst. Hello? How many of you know a good cold water, cup of cold water on a hot sunny day goes a long way? Amen. He said, I wish you were hot. I mean, you, you need a hot water to make a good cup of coffee, a good cup of tea. So he said, I wish you were hot or cold, but not lukewarm. And I think Rich Spa was hot. Mm -hmm. She knew how to fight the good fight of faith. She knew how to stand in the gap. She knew how to intercede for her children. Amen. Notice what God told the church. He got to verse 16. He said to the church who was neither hot nor cold. He said, so then because you are lukewarm. Can you say lukewarm? You know, lukewarm water is water you take to wash between your toes. <laughs> Hello, somebody. That, that, <laughs> that's... <laughs> Jesus said, Sings that's how you are. Sings that's the temperature you want to keep. I will what? Spew you out of my mouth. This is what Jesus is saying. People who are lukewarm in the church, they sicken him. That's what he's saying. How many of you know lukewarm water does that? It just sickens you. You just spit it out. Hello, somebody. And do you know why we're lukewarm? Because we choose to stay lukewarm. Hello, somebody. It is a, hear me, it is a choice. It is a what? 
uh, listen to me, spirituality doesn't just blanket people. Hello? I, would you agree? Spiritual, it doesn't just blanket you, spirituality. You've got to make a conscious decision today. I've got eight hours. Sorry. 24. Somebody, I, ain't getting, I ain't getting no help. But that's okay. You got to say, okay, today I've been given an allotment of 24 hours. I know the government, I know, I know I got to live and make a living. That's eight gone. I know I got to sleep, that's another eight. But Lord have mercy, I got eight left. What am I, what am I going to do with that eight left? Uh-huh. What am I going to do with that eight left? Am I going to use it to achieve my own objective? Am I going to use it to be right? I want to be right all the time. You want to be right what? <laughs> Hallelujah. Huh? Or, or, look, it doesn't take it doesn't take a lot. It, it doesn't take a lot. Thirty minutes, forty-five minutes. I'm not even asking you to spread sackcloth and ashes. <laughs> I'm not, nobody's asking you to go on a fast. No, that will help. That will put the devil in his place, and that will help us rescue our kids. Are you with me? He'll give us the influence. Listen, listen. Mothers, hear me. Hear me. Hear me, mothers. You have influence over your children, whether they're married or not. I have seen it. I, for, that matter, for that matter, a mother and father can choreograph the life of their children while they're born. You can say what they're going to be. So, uh -huh. Example. Can I give an example? I was born. I was born. I didn't know. My mother said, because I'm the third my two first brothers died. Uh, Ezekiel and Dorian died. And, and she said, she said, when she got pregnant with me, she went to God, she said, this one is not dying. The two first ones died. She said, I want you to name him. She said, the name Emmanuel came in a dream. So she started calling him. She didn't even know what he meant. She was a Catholic. She did not know what Emmanuel meant. So she started calling Emmanuel, talking, talking to the baby. She would say, Emmanuel, I'm going to feed you, and so on and so forth. Well, born almost died. You know how you come out, bridge? Yeah. I, the doctor said, I almost lose my life. I, I don't feel it, but they said it happened. Yeah. <laughs> Hear me. And she said, when I was born, as soon as the doctor gave her, she went on her knees and said, Lord, first born, I give him to you to be a preacher. Hear me. She never told me. She said, I, she said, he will be a man of God. Never told me. So I'm going to school for an accounting. <laughs> yeah. Glory be to God. I went to Pfizer in New York. Got me a good internship. Glory be to God. And I said, they said, Emmanuel, when you come back, we'll give you, we'll support you, pay for your PhD, come back, be a tax consultant. I came back to farming. I said, I got it going on. <laughs> Glory be to God. I came and I went to Dean Mobley. I said, Dean, <laughs> thank you so much for sitting on the board of Pfizer. You know, she sat on a lot of boards. And she knew what they were looking for, so she, she changed the curriculum. Anyhow, let me not get into that. So she said, Emmanuel, that's good. She said, have you ever thought of sit, uh, sitting for the CPA? I said, yes. So she chose five of us to sit for the CPA. Because, you know, accounting... Man, I was so excited. Glory be to God. I went to school next semester. Step in school. Son, I got a call from the uh, registrar's office. None of your scholarship money came. I said, what? I have letters. They said, none came. I called, I called, I called. I called, I called, I called, I called. Would I called my mother. I said, mommy. Can you pray with me? What's happening? What she said, what son? I said, all the scholarships I had disappeared. I said, mom, it's not because of bad grades. We had a change of government. The other government established ties with Cuba and Libya. And so those of us who were here, they never supported us anymore. Uh, Dr. Humphreys, who had promised me an out of state, left FAMU. So the out of state disappeared. He never put it in paper, in writing. Just one thing after the other. And I said, when I explained to her, she said, you're saying you have no money. And she said, oh, he didn't forget. <laughs> so I said, who didn't forget? What are you talking about? She said, son, I'm so, she began crying. I'm so sorry. When you were a baby, I went on my knees. 
and I gave you to God to be a preacher. <laughs> and I never told you because I wanted you to make that decision yourself. She has integrity. She never said to me, you have to be a preacher. You are a... She gave it to God and God takes covenants. Yeah. Serious! Yeah. Some of the things we've been saying on our kids about our kids, we better stop it. Please. Hello, somebody. And that's why I am where I am today. I wanted to be an accountant, but my life was pretty much choreographed, spoken over by a mother. That's why I'm telling you, mothers, you are up. It's your time to bat for your kids today. It's our time here. Yeah? And not only mothers, fathers too. Because the world is after our kids. Young men, you are strong. That's what the Bible says. And the devil is looking for strong kids. Because you've known the father. He's after our kids. He's after our little girls. He's after our little boys, our babies, because you want to take them to hell. You see, the young generation, you can some way, uh, I'm looking, influence them. There's a word, um, that's the word, indoctrinate them. So that's what he's looking to do. He, can't, he, 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 doesn't, have, he doesn't have much for us. Yeah, he'll try to tempt us, and, but he's after our kids. And God sent me this morning to sound the alarm. Even to parents today. Are you with me? Do like the very first thing, and I'm going to bring it to a close. I know that's my third time saying that, but believe me, I'm going to take it to a close. The very first thing, the very first thing Ritzpah did, let us see what she did when her sons, when she heard her sons were hung. What did she do? Can you go to a verse 14, I think? Is it verse 14? Can, uh, verse 10, I think. Is it verse 10 or 11? You'll see. 10? Uh-huh. And here, and rich and rich pa, the daughter of Aya, took what? No, let, let me tell you what she did. She called her friends and she said, You all, do you know what happened to my sons? You know, you know, the, my sons, I no, she didn't do that. She said, It's time to fight, it's time for intercessory prayer. Enough talk. I have one last wish for my sons and that they be not dishonored. It doesn't matter how long. Listen, 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 since you do not hear me, we can fight so our children will not dishonor us or they won't be dishonored. We still have time to fight for our kids. We have to stop talking about them the wrong way it doesn't matter how much how we feel we have to say she's a good boy she's a good child she's a good girl thank you <laughs> she's a good girl she will be such and such he will be such and such yes they're married to such and such but i'm still mother i'm still father are you with me i still can fight for my children <laughs> Uh, you, you, <laughs> the power a parent has, uh, the influence is far reaching and powerful. Let, let me tell you, let me share with you. You know, when I, was, when I was growing up in the Pentecostal church, there were some people who were called prayer warriors, <laughs> intercessors. Are you with me? So it seemed like these were a group reserved. The ones who seem to have, you, Deaconess, you know what I'm talking about. We looked at them like, well, those are the ones who have power with God. We, we are the peons. And so every prayer, every need I had, I used to run to them. Can you pray for this for me? Can you pray for that for me? And they would say, yes, son, I will pray. I will go to God. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. You all, yeah, baby? Look, <laughs> hear me. You don't have to do that anymore. We are all children of God. I'm not sure where to get that from. I know the Bible says call the corn, the, the, the cunning women. Look at it. Who knows how to pray? Listen to it properly. That's wrong. That's bad context. Listen to what the Bible, hear, hear, hear it. Listen to what God says in Ezekiel chapter 22. He said, I look for a human being to stand. Let me, God sent me to tell you, he's looking 
for humans to stand in the what? Is it easy, Carol? You, you got to see that first. If we haven't done anything else today, you need to see that first. Because God tell me, tell the church, I'm still looking for such. Oh, God, we give you glory. Yes, Lord. It's coming right up. Bless God. God sent me to tell you that's what he's looking for. He's still looking. For, amen. For men and women to stand in the gap. Ezekiel 22, 30 to 31. He says, God said, the nation of Israel was an utter ruin. Hear me? And God is looking for a spiritual leader. Somebody he can talk to. Somebody he can influence to change the direction of the nation. And God said, I sought for a man. The word man here means mortal. M-O-R-T-A-L. So it could mean man or woman. Amen? I sought for a mortal among them that should make up the hedge. You know what is to make up the hedge? You know what the hedge is? A hedge protects. Somebody who would surround the nation with prayer. Uh, some mother, some father who would surround their children with prayer. Hold on. See, and stand in the gap before me for what? Stand in the gap before me for their children. And what happened? That I should not want destroy it. Here is what God said. But I found none. Please take time to meditate on the word and let it sink into your heart and soul and mind today. Knowing that the Christian who meditates on the word will be like a tree planted by the water, bringing forth fruit in its season and prospering in all that he does. But what if you aren't a Christian today? What if you don't know if you're bound for heaven as a forgiven child of God? If that's you, then let's take care of it right now if you're ready. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Are you ready to be forgiven of your sins and washed clean and made new? Are you ready to begin your new life in Christ? Then turn to God right now and say, Lord, I love you. I need you. I repent of my sins. Lord, please forgive me and wash me clean. I receive your forgiveness right now as I put my faith in Jesus as my Savior. God, please lead me and teach me and show me how to live from now on. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And if you're looking for a good church family, you'll be welcomed with open arms at Imitators of God Ministries, Colossal Vivacious Church in Tallahassee, located at 4750 Capital Circle Southeast near Tram Road. Sunday school begins for all ages at 10 a.m. and the morning service begins at 11. And the Wednesday evening service begins at 7. This is a life-giving, multicultural, multi-generational church where people of all races, backgrounds, and walks of life come together to worship, to be inspired in their love for God, to develop relationships, and to be empowered to live out God's purpose for their lives. Find more information on their website, imitatorsofgodministries.com, or call the church, 850-408-8496.